All right. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for taking part in this. Um, my name is Sarah McPherson. I also go by Sam. Uh, I'm one of the co-coordinators of the Solidarity Collective, along with my good friend Shelby, who's sitting over there. Um, the Solidarity Collective is a grassroots network of BIPOC and LGBTQ2S plus uh, artists and activists. Come on in, feel free to grab a seat. Um, and we all connect through accessible, creative, anti-hate awareness and healing. Uh, the collective came together through funding from the Safer and Vital Communities Grant with the support of the Thunder Bay Multicultural Association and the Thunder Bay Community Safety and Wellbeing Council. So uh, some of our past projects, which some people may already be aware of, include uh, a mural that's on the corner of St. Paul and Cook Street, uh, the Love is in the Air billboard, which is currently up on the corner of Simpson and Northern, uh, a large number of community workshops, including uh, climate change discussions, printmaking, stitch work, and communicating with systems of power. We arranged this discussion to address a need uh, to increase awareness and knowledge about this issue. So I want to say thank you, a great big chi miigwech to uh, Russ for taking the time to share and discuss with us today. And I would also like to extend our gratitude to CoLab and Goods and Co Market for hosting our in-person gathering today and also to uh, my sister, Mary McPherson, for coordinating with us to make this happen. And with that, I will pass it along to Mary, do a little introduction. Hi, everyone. It's really nice to see familiar names here. Um, and I wanna take the time to thank everyone for uh, joining today's discussion on Canada's implementation of UNDRIP. Um, so our speaker today, and we're very fortunate to have uh, Russell Diabo join us today. Um, Russell Diabo is a member of the Mohawk Nation at Ganawage. He's one of the leading Aboriginal rights, uh, voices on Aboriginal rights in Canada, and um, he has experience in political, international, and grassroots advocacy. Having been on the front lines during the Oka crisis, the 1972 BIA takeover in Washington, D.C., and Wounded Knee, he is currently special advisor to AFN National Chief Roseanne Archibald. We're very grateful that Russell Diabo has agreed to speak with us today on this very important issue of Canada's implementation of UNDRIP and what it means for our futures. Uh, so thank you. And, and with that, I, I, I welcome uh, you to, to start on this presentation. Well, thanks very much for um inviting me uh, to present. Um, this is uh, kind of an urgent issue because um, the UN, uh, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, um, the federal government uh, plans on um, tabling before Parliament before June 21 of this year, um, a final action plan to implement the objectives of um, their version of it. So I presented, a, I prepared a PowerPoint, uh, which I'd like to go through. It'll take me about an hour. Um, about an hour to go through it. Um, and then I guess we can open it up for um, questions um, and comments, I guess. So um, I would, can you, you can hear me okay? We can hear you just fine and we can see your PowerPoint too. Okay, good. So I was asked to speak on the implementation of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. What does it mean? And uh, as I mentioned, Justice Canada uh, has a draft United Nations uh, Declaration Act, uh, a national action plan. You better get used to this acronym UNDA because it's uh, you're gonna hear a lot of it. Um, it stands for the UN, United Nations Declaration Act, which is Bill C-15, uh, which passed into law last year. So I have four parts to my presentation. Um, because it's kind of a complicated issue and I didn't know the background of, of the audience, um, I put together a background or context of Indigenous issues in Canada. Um, so I have a few slides to go through before we talk about the content of Bill C-15. And then I wanna um, 
talk about the, a summary of the Justice Department's draft action plan, um, which includes the federal department uh, measures and priorities of, of different government departments, mainly um, um, Indigenous Services Canada and Crown Indigenous Relations, but it goes to, it's a whole of government approach. So I'll get into that. And then I'll, I'll conclude, I have a conclusion uh, to make after I present. So the first thing that uh, we have to remember that in Canada, there's a constitutional division of federal and provincial powers. So this is a federal law. Um, Bill C-15 is a federal law um, regarding the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, each province um, would have to develop their own law um, to address the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So far, the only province that's done that in Canada is uh, the government of British Columbia. And um, there's a lot of issues around how they're proceeding because implementation of the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples necessarily involves interpretation of the, the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And that's where a lot of the problems come in is the differing interpretations as to what what the um, articles of the UN Declaration mean in Canada and in other parts of the world as well, other countries. But this is important to, to remember that we're talking about a federal law here. The provinces uh, have their own uh, constitutional authority under the Constitution Act 1867, which used to be called the British North America Act. They have Section 92 powers, and that's where the Ford government is, you know, um, exercising their authority in areas over um, mines and other, other uh, issues we're hearing in Ontario right now. So I wanna talk about the key, there's 46 um, articles of the UN Declaration. I wanna talk about the key ones that I think are really important. Um, the first one, the most important one is Article 3, um, which says Indigenous peoples have the right to self-determination and by virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. And next to that is Article 4 of the UN Declaration, which says Indigenous peoples, in exercising their right to self-determination, have the right to autonomy or self-government in matters relating to their internal and local affairs, as well as ways and means for financing their autonomous functions. So I put a note here that it's important to, to note that self-determination is an international right of peoples, while self-government is defined in a federal policy to transition bans um, out of the Indian Act into a federal um, indigenous municipal governments with natural person powers, meaning a legal person or corporation in federal law. And there are 22 self-government agreements in Canada, including in Ontario, uh, there's several. And um, it's, it's parallel to the way a province um, gives a municipality natural person powers through the municipal charter, you know, to enter into contracts, to, to hold money, to hire people and so forth. So self-government is parallel to uh, how the federal government passes laws through parliament, um, establishing self-government um, the same way that provinces do it to municipalities. So Article uh, 26 is very important. Um, it says, 26.1 uh, says, Indigenous peoples have the right to the lands, territories, and resources, which they have traditionally owned, occupied, or otherwise used or acquired. 26.2 uh, says, Indigenous peoples have the right to own, use, develop, and control the lands, territories, and resources that they possess by reason of traditional ownership or other traditional occupation or use as well as those they have otherwise acquired. And uh, 26.3 says, states shall give legal recognition and protection to these lands, territories, and resources. Such recognition shall be conducted with the due respect for the customs, traditions, and land tenure systems of the indigenous peoples concerned. So it's really about restoration of lands, territories, and resources in this article 26. Article 27 says states shall establish and implement in conjunction with indigenous peoples concerned, a fair, independent, impartial, open and transparent process giving due recognition 
to Indigenous peoples' laws, traditions, customs, and land tenure systems to recognize and adjudicate the rights of Indigenous peoples pertaining to their lands, territories, and resources, including those which were traditionally owned or otherwise occupied or used. Ind Indigenous people shall have the right to participate in this process. And so the land claims uh, policies of Canada that go back to 1973 um, were nowhere, nowhere near co-developed uh, with First Nations or Indigenous peoples. Uh, they were unilaterally imposed by Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau and his Minister of Indian Affairs, Jean Chrétien. Those same land claims policies are in place today, and they're inconsistent with this article. Article 28.1 says Indigenous peoples have the right to redress by means that can include restitution or when this is not possible, fair, just, and equitable compensation for the lands, territories, and resources which they have traditionally owned or otherwise occupied or used and which have been confiscated, taken, occupied, used, or damaged without their free prior informed consent. And 28.2 says, unless otherwise freely agreed upon by the people's concern, compensation shall take the form of lands, territories, and resources, equal in quality, size, and legal status, or of monetary compensation or other appropriate redress. So these articles involve um, a model of restoration or restitution of lands, territories, and resources that have been taken without free prior informed consent. Canada's land claims policies are completely in breach of, of these minimum international standards. And the most troubling uh, article in the 46 articles of the UN Declaration is Article 46.1. This was added at the last minute by the African Union. Um, in the final uh, declaration that I'll get into, but it, Article 46.1 says, nothing in this declaration may be interpreted as applying for any state, people, group, or person, any right to engage in any activity or to perform any act contrary to the Charter of the United Nations, or construed as authorizing or encouraging any action which would dismember or impair totally or impart the territorial integrity or political unity of sovereign and independent states. So this is what Canada will rely on or relies on for its assertion of a assumed crown sovereignty and crown title uh, is, is this article. Although they took that position before the UN declaration uh, was adopted by the UN. So um, Madam Erica, Dr. Erica Diaz was the chair of the United Nations Working Group on Indigenous Populations. Um, this is her picture. To, to the left, she's in the middle between uh, Grand Chief Stuart Phillip, the president of the Union of BC Indian Chiefs, to her left. To her right is the late Arthur Manuel, who, who passed away in 2017. Uh, he was chief of Nisqualith and um, chairman of the Shishwab Nation Tribal Council and spokesperson for the Interior Alliance of uh, Indigenous Nations in BC at the time this picture was taken, which was around 2000. So the UN Working Group on Indigenous Populations was a standard setting body uh, at the United Nations. Um, Madam Diaz um, was the chair from 1982 to 2005. Uh, it met annually in Geneva, which is where most of the human rights uh, bodies are located um, at the United Nations in Geneva. So every summer um, to be involved every July, Indigenous peoples from around the world would have to travel to Geneva to be part of the standard setting exercise um, for what became the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, it took many years to work on, on that. So the, the UN Declaration was watered down at the United Nations. There were three drafts of the UN Declaration. Uh, in 1994 was the original text version developed by that working group on Indigenous populations. In 2006, a uh, second amended version of the UN Declaration um, was the version that the Human Rights Council uh, had drafted. And in 2007, the final version of the UN Declaration um, is the version that the UN General Assembly passed after changes were made by the African Union at the last minute. And those changes were never properly presented to Indigenous peoples globally. <clears throat> And it's the first uh, 1994 original text version of the UN Declaration, which was drafted by hundreds of Indigenous representatives over a period of years, 
with their direct participation. Uh, it was undermined by state governments in the politicized negotiations through the UN human rights bodies until the, the final version was adopted by the General Assembly in, uh, in 2007. And um, when it was adopted in 2007, there were four countries that voted against it. I believe there were 11 who abstained, but the four who voted against it were all former British colonies. And that was Canada, the United States, New Zealand and Australia. Those four countries voted against the, the 2007 version of the UN Declaration. So there's a book called Indigenous Nations Rights in the, in the Balance. You can get this online. It was written by Charmaine Whiteface, the Lakota, who, who um, was representing the Lakota Nation throughout the process of the UN developing the draft declaration on the rights of Indigenous peoples. This book lays out the side by side uh, changes to the articles in the UN Declaration to show how the, the, uh, the declaration was watered down and the purpose changed um, from 1994 to the, 19, to the 2007 version. So if you're interested in the UN Declaration, the background to it, this is an important book to get hold of. So in 2014, there was a North American Indigenous Peoples Caucus and they called for the cancellation of the United Nations World Conference on Indigenous Peoples. It's important to understand this is the background to what we're dealing with here with the UN Declaration and what Canada is doing. Um, so the North American Indigenous Peoples Caucus was representative of Indigenous uh, representatives of com Indigenous communities and nations in Canada, the United States, and Mexico. And um, they operate from the foundational principle that every deliber deliberation, decision, or document by any entity that fundamentally affects us, our territories, our interests, or our future generations must include our full, equal, and effective participation. This principle applies no less to the decisions and organs of the United Nations than it does to any other entity. The United Nations is duty bound to honor and respect the fundamental rights of all peoples as embodied in the UN Charter, Human Rights Covenants, UN Conventions, including ILO Convention 169, which was an international labor organization convention, and declarations, including the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, adopted in 2007. But on December 21st in 2010, the General Assembly decided to organize a high level plenary uh, meeting of the General Assembly, to be known as the World Conferences of Indigenous Peoples, to be held in 2014. And in, in March of uh, 2013, at a North American Indigenous Peoples Caucus meeting in California, um, it was established through consensus. Uh, in standards of analysis and review regarding the proposed UN high level plenary meeting, also fraudulently called the World Conference of Indigenous Peoples. Uh, these standards were applied by the North American uh, delegation uh, at the meeting in Alta, Norway in June of 2013. Uh, the bedrock of the North American Indigenous Peoples uh, caucus position regarding Indigenous Peoples' participation in the high level plenary uh, meeting is that participation must be full and equal. And uh, we, meaning the North American Indigenous Peoples Caucus, decided in March of, of uh, 2013 that they would revisit the question of the high level plenary meeting at the 2014 uh, meeting of the North American Indigenous Peoples Caucus, and then decide on any further participation in planning or, uh, or participation in the high level plenary meeting for 2014. <clears throat> there was a, a pre-meeting um, of Indigenous peoples in Alta, Norway, in Samiland, and in the months following that Alta meeting, and in particular in, on February 26, 2014, the President of the United Nations General Assembly made it clear in a, in a document that equal and effective participation by Indigenous peoples would not occur at the high-level plenary meeting. And therefore, the North American Indigenous Peoples conditions that were established in, at a California meeting and that were repeated at Alta Norway meeting have not been respected and have been ignored by the um, president of the General Assembly of the United Nations. 
given the chain of events and given the short timeline before the uh, scheduled high level plenary meeting, um, the North American Indigenous Peoples Caucus um, did not see conditions for participation as equals uh, at the high level plenary meeting being met. So as a result, the North American Indigenous Peoples Caucus called for the immediate cancellation of the high level plenary meeting by the UN General Assembly. They also called on the state of Mexico to cancel its planned technical meeting to begin drafting uh, the outcome document for the high level plenary meeting or what they called the World Council, uh, World Conference on Indigenous Peoples. And they also called on the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues to cancel any further participation and additional preparatory or advisory meetings for the high level plenary meeting. Additionally, uh, the North American Indigenous Peoples Caucus advances a position throughout Great Turtle Island and to the world's indigenous peoples to call for the cancellation of the high level plenary meeting and to withhold any and all support and participation. We call for the withdrawal of any support active or tacit for the high level plenary meeting by indigenous peoples anywhere in the world. Now at these UN meetings, this outcome document is basically based on the consensus that comes out of the meetings. And uh, the reason why the North American Indigenous Peoples Caucus called for the cancellation of this high level plenary uh, UN meeting on indigenous issues was that um, it was being controlled by the United Nations. So the, you know, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples um, recognized the right of self-determination it was viewed by the North American Indigenous Peoples Caucus that uh, by not allowing for co-chair and, and co-development of the conference on Indigenous peoples, um, that it was an unfair process being totally run by the United Nations and being contrary to the UN Declaration, which the General Assembly had adopted. So that was a position taken by the North American Indigenous Peoples Caucus. But once that uh, call for a cancellation of the high level plenary meeting was uh, was called, they went ahead with the meeting anyway. And it was basically a half day UN controlled uh, uh, conference at the United Nations. And the only way you could get into that uh, conference is you had to be um, uh, recognized by state governments. So the ones from Canada had to be approved by the government of Canada to even enter the room, get the credentials to enter and to be involved in the discussions there. And basically it was the larger um, organizations that agreed uh, to participate in the process. Uh, there were a lot of indigenous uh, communities and peoples uh, who did not agree with that, but these larger organizations and regional organizations decided that they were going to attend. So they did have uh, a number of indigenous delegates attend that uh, conference. And so it was held in September of 2014 in New York. Um, the stated purpose was to share perspectives and best practices on the, the realization of the rights of indigenous peoples, including pursuing the objectives of the UN declaration. But in its outcome document, the participating state governments committed to cooperating with indigenous peoples through their own representative institutions to develop and implement national action plans, strategies, and other measures where relevant to achieve the ends of the declaration. But the right of self-determination for indigenous peoples, the international legal right of indigenous uh, nations freely to determine our own political status and freely pursue our economic, social, and cultural development, um, which is in article three of the UN declaration was mentioned nowhere in the outcome uh, document of this high level plenary. And so these national action plans that Canada is pursuing, the United States and countries around the world came out of this meeting in 2014. So this is, this is where it's, it started on how they were going to um, implement the UN Declaration. Because in the United Nations, there isn't one particular body that's been assigned to address the implementation of the UN Declaration. It's a number of bodies. Um, and it's up to each state to develop its own national action plan now, which Canada has been doing. It's called a national reconciliation uh, plan. So going back to the Global Indigenous Preparatory Conference in 2013 in Alta, Norway, 
Um, that's me with my friend, uh, the late Arthur Manuel, going to the um, to the meeting in Alta Norway, and we met two Sami ladies there who are greeting delegates uh, to the meeting. To the right is a picture of the North American Indigenous Peoples Caucus uh, representatives who went to Alta Norway to participate in negotiating um, an outcome document in preparation for the 2014 meeting, where the recommendations, uh, the Alta outcome document was recommendations to state governments on how to deal with Indigenous uh, people's rights. So there were Indigenous delegates from seven regions of the world um, that carried out uh, the preparation of the conference, which included a meeting in June 2013 in Alta Norway in order to negotiate a common position in the Alta outcome document. It was hosted and initiated by the Sami Parliament of Norway. Um, and the Alta outcome document contains recommendations to the states. You can get that Alta outcome document online. If you Google it, uh, you can find it. But the main, the first point it made in that document was, uh, and these were directed at state governments. Number one, in order to fulfill their obligations to guarantee Indigenous people's right of self-determination and permanent sovereignty over our lands, territories, resources, air, ice, oceans, waters, mountains, and forests, we recommend that states, as a matter of urgency, establish effective mechanisms through agreements reached with Indigenous peoples concerned to effectively implement the aforementioned rights consistent with the state's obligations under international law, the UN Charter, the Declaration, the treaties and agreements concluded with Indigenous peoples and nations. So the United Nations is another huge bureaucracy, but they have three uh, Indigenous mechanisms at the United Nations where Indigenous peoples can take their issues. One is the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, which was established in 2000 and uh, meets annually in New York City every April. Um, they're just finishing up the second week of their meeting now uh, in New York City. Uh, then there's the United Nations Expert Mechanism on Indigenous Issues. That was established in 2007, and that basically took over from the United Nations Working Group on Indigenous Populations. And um, the Experts Mechanism does a lot of studies, but they, they basically amount to recommendations to the UN system. And then the third uh, mechanism is the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, Francisco uh, Cali is the current um, Special Rapporteur. And he just did a country visit in Canada at the beginning of March, I believe. He spent a week here touring and visiting. And he did a preliminary report, but he has to produce um, a 10-page report, uh, I think, by this fall. So these are the th three main uh, mechanisms dealing with indigenous issues at the United Nations. There are others, um, other human rights bodies, but I won't get into all that now. Just to show you this uh, chart, this gives you an idea of the bureaucracy, you know, with the General Assembly, the Security Council, the Economic and Social Council, the UN Secretariat, the International Court of Justice, uh, the Trusteeship Council. It's a, it's a huge uh, bureaucracy with buildings in New York City and in Geneva. And so anybody that's done any international work, you'll, you'll know what I mean. And it takes years to, to get any, anything going there. So getting to Canada's definition of the UN Declaration. In order to understand the Trudeau government's uh, 2015 promise to adopt the UN Declaration, you need to refer back to the beginning of the federal liberal government's mandate. In 2016, at the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, the Minister of uh, Indigenous Affairs, as it was called then, Carolyn Bennett gave qualified, not unqualified support to endorsing the UN Declaration. Uh, her statement is, uh, Carolyn Bennett's statement is the basis for the UN domestic definition of the UN Declaration. As she told the UN Permanent Forum, uh, we intend nothing less than to adopt and implement the Declaration in accordance with the Canadian Constitution. Canada believes that our constitutional obligations serve to fulfill all of the principles of the Declaration, including free prior informed consent. We see modern treaties and self-government agreements as the ultimate expression of free prior informed consent among partners. 
Uh, that was Carolyn Bennett, part of her statement to the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. So her 2016 statement confirms that the federal inherent right uh, in self-government, uh, sorry, inherent right to self-government and comprehensive land claims policies are the basis for implementing the objectives of the UN Declaration in accordance with the constitutional division of federal and provincial powers. Jody Wilson-Raybould, who was then the Minister of Justice and Attorney General, was also at the 2016 meeting of the UN Permanent Forum, and she reinforced Minister Bennett's position on endorsing the UN Declaration. She said, there's a need for a national action plan in Canada, which comes out of that 2014 high-level plenary meeting, something our government has been referring to as a reconciliation framework, and we do not need to reinvent the wheel completely. Within Canada, there are modern treaties and examples of self-government, both comprehensive and sectoral. There are regional and national indigenous institutions that support nation rebuilding, for example, in land management and financial administration. And this is why the, the Department of Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs Canada annually tracks the number of communities where treaties, self-government agreements, and other constructive arrangements have been concluded. Um, that means, what, to be clear, this annual results indicator measures the number of modern treaties, self-government agreements, and First Nations with fiscal bylaws or laws, and First Nations with established land codes, um, the number of them. This, this is the federal reconciliation framework, and this is what uh, is contained in the uh, draft uh, action plan as well. There's four... Uh, Canada has four policies to unilaterally define inherent treaty rights, um, interpreting Aboriginal treaty rights in section 35 and in the, the UN declaration articles. There's the inherent right to self-government, um, which basically um, transitions uh, First Nations into municipal self-government. There's the comprehensive land claims policy, which um, leads to de facto extinguishment of Aboriginal title for those that enter into modern treaties. There's the specific claims policy, which is based on what Canada considers lawful obligations. And that would include things like um, when reserves are promised in treaties called treaty land entitlement. Um, they, they would give money or they do give money um, for claims that are being settled. And the policy under specific claims is to give money, not land back. So you have to take the money and, and buy uh, lands to get them converted back to reserve lands. And that's through the fourth policy, the additions to reserve policy. And on average, I understand it takes up to seven years to take a purchase piece of land and get it converted into reserve lands. Um, and they have a backlog of five years of um, requests for additions to reserve. And these negotiation policies, the four of them are, are inconsistent with the UN Declaration. Article three, recognizing the rights of self-determination and articles 26, 27 and 28, dealing with the restoration of lands, territories and resources or restitution. This is a map and you can get this from the government of Canada online. Uh, it shows the uh, modern treaties uh, covering in Canada with First Nations, Métis and Inuit, and also the historic treaties, the number of treaties and the pre-Confederation treaties uh, that exist in Canada. But large parts of Canada have not uh, settled, like in British Columbia, Quebec and the Atlantic. Those are only um, treaties of peace and friendship. They didn't deal with land. So there's large parts of Canada that have unresolved Aboriginal title issues. This is a map of the um, Indian bands or reserves across Canada, you know, First Nations. Uh, shows you that um, pretty much in every province and territory, there are um, First Nations uh, that exist and they're all facing um, these four policies that I mentioned to negotiate their way out of the Indian Act. Uh, Canada has also set up these national land and fiscal institutions and um, those are the institutions that um, Jody Wilson-Raybould was referring to. Um, their job is to help uh, bands get out of the Indian Act and into self-government. 
these national fiscal institutions in particular, the First Nations Fiscal Management Act is there to support the inherent right policy to self-government. Uh, there's three institutions. There's the First Nations Financial Management Board. They deal with the uh, financial management uh, system certification, the Financial Management Board's financial administrative law, financial performance certification. <clears throat> First Nations Finance Authority advises on financial services. There's a revolving loan fund for, for First Nations who join in to that uh, membership to that finance authority. They offer investment services and advisory services. And then there's the First Nations Tax Commission who are encouraging uh, real property taxation on reserve as a way to get own source revenue um, for the chronic underfunding that exists. And hundreds of uh, First Nations are going to these bodies because uh, it's basically where the federal government is directing them if they want to get additional monies. So regardless of what process an Indian Act band or a First Nation goes into, they've set up these recognition and self-determinations across termination tables across Canada. There's a number of them in Ontario. They have these modern treaty tables in British Columbia and elsewhere. They have self-government tables and they have these alternative federal laws to the Indian Act, which leads to tax codes and tax systems but they all lead to this full self-government status of municipal corporations under the inherent right policy, which is the umbrella policy. And there is a phased elimination of Indian reserves into private property or fee simple. And Tom Flanagan and Manny Jules um, started working on that under the Stephen Harper government, but it still continues now under the Trudeau government. Um, initially it was called the First Nations Property Ownership Initiative to privatize residential lands on reserve. Now it's called the Indigenous Land Title Initiative. It sounds nicer, but it's still about, you know, um, privatizing residential lands on reserve. It's draft legislation they've been working on. So there's basically three ways out of the Indian Act that the Trudeau government is um, facilitating. Really one way I would argue, door number one, the fourth level of self-government because the prime minister is referred to indigenous governments as the fourth level of government in Canada. Um, the second door is land claims or modern treaties, but that would include specific claims as well. And the third uh, door is alternative federal laws to the Indian Act, which is the First Nations Land Management Act and the First Nations Fiscal Management Act. But really that's um, an interim approach to self-government, full self-government, uh, you know, require signing a self-government agreement. And even modern treaties are self-government agreements just involving land and cash. So since 2015, the Trudeau government has used a pan-Indigenous uh, two-track approach to, to uh, reconciliation, including the UN Declaration or Bill C-15. IST Concern Act, those are the two federal departments that were set up to, to replace the Department of Indian Affairs, which they dissolved in 2019. Uh, ISC is the Indigenous Services Canada Department. Um, Patty Hadju from Thunder Bay is the uh, Minister of ISC. Uh, CERNAC is Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs Canada. And Mark Miller from Montreal is the Minister of, of CERNAC. Um, so those are the two ministers that uh, First Nations have to deal with now and other Indigenous peoples. So Canada's definition of the UN Declaration um, to implement Canada's definition of the UN Declaration and to fulfill the Liberal government's promise to re-engage in a renewed nation-to-nation -nation process with Indigenous peoples. In December of 2015, Prime Minister Trudeau announced a whole-of-government two-track approach to Indigenous reconciliation, followed by his government issuing 10 principles for Indigenous relationships and replacing the Department of Indian Affairs with two new departments as I said, Indigenous Services Canada and Crown Indigenous Relations Canada. Um, in the federal two-track uh, process, the role of the Indigenous Services Canada is to prepare First Nations for the devolution or takeover of programs and entering into self-government through capacity building, including 10-year funding grants. And the role of Crown Indigenous Relations is to implement existing self-government agreements, including modern treaties, and the alternative to the Indian Act legislative arrangements, 
through those national land and financial management agreement institutions I referred to, and to continue this approach regarding the negotiation of inherent treaty rights with the rest of the First Nations through the inherent right to self-government policy and the comprehensive land claims policy, as well as specific claims and additions to reserve. So the 2022 annual report by the Minister of Justice and Attorney General David Lametti sets out the context of how the federal government interprets the UN Declaration and the actions of federal departments are taking towards implementing the federal definition of untrue. So as I said, um, the self-government, the inherent right to self-government policy is the umbrella policy for all discussions and negotiations in Canada with First Nations, Métis and Inuit. And it was imposed in 1995 by then Prime Minister Jean Chrétien. But this is still the main policy that the government of Canada is using, including how they're interpreting self-determination uh, in their draft uh, action plan. And this 1995 policy on uh, self-government, it rejects First Nations sovereignty. It subordinates inherent rights to the Charter of uh, Rights. It denies inherent jurisdiction of First Nations, and it requires individual negotiations over national principles and the international right of self-determination. Um, the, the inherent right policy is also was also mirrored in Canada's 2018 rights framework. They were proposing a rights recognition law in 2018, um, which was rejected. Um, and even though they say they recognize the inherent right, it requires, um, the policy requires a negotiation of inherent rights, not recognition of them. And it creates three tiers or lists of subject matters. There's a list uh, in the self-government policy of matters that are negotiable, a list that they consider are not inherent rights, but they're prepared to delegate uh, rights um, to indigenous uh, groups. And then there's a list of non-negotiable uh, matters which are not on the table and not subject to negotiation. And this inherent right policy was rejected by chiefs in assembly in 1995, uh, but many are negotiating under it now, hundreds, I would say. And there's continued to be a call for First Nations led process in, in different uh, resolutions through the assembly of First Nations. So Canada Bill C-15 uh, was introduced into parliament by the Minister of Justice, uh, David Lametti, who's also uh, from Montreal, um, a minister, uh, one of the part of the Quebec caucus uh, and many of the cabinet ministers of, of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau come from Quebec. Um, so a big issue with Bill C-15 was the engagement process was too short and excluded title and rights holders. Uh, Bill C-15 was introduced during a pandemic into parliament on December 3rd, 2020, after only a six week engagement process bypassing the rights holders who are the indigenous communities and nations. The federal government focused on national and regional indigenous organizations. And this is not the standard for pre-fire and foreign consent or respectful of our right of self-determination. This brings disrepute to the process and many of our leaders and peoples have been complaining about being excluded uh, and the short process involved before this was introduced into parliament. Bill C-15 is a federal law that received royal assent on June 21st, 2021. In the preamble, although positive, it just does not contain binding obligations. Preambles can have significant interpretive value. The legal effect of the preamble is confirmed by Section 13 of the Federal Interpretation Act, which says that the preamble of an enactment should be read as part of the enactment intended to assist in explaining its, its purpose and object. The main criticism of Bill C-15 is that some elements of the preamble should be repeated in the body of the legislation in order to give it greater prescriptive value and legal weight. And Bill C-15 has seven main operative sections. It's a short uh, piece of legislation. Section one involves the title, which is the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. It's also referred to as the United Nations Declaration Act, uh, UNDA. Um, section 2.2 uh, defines the rights of Indigenous peoples, uh, and that definition maintains the common law interpretation of Section 35.1 of the Constitution Act uh, 1982, and that's heavily based on the colonial doctrine of discovery. 
and this section was not amended to reject the doctrine of discovery, only the preamble was amended to reject it. And um, section 35.2 of the Constitution Act means Aboriginal Peoples of Canada. So basically in section 35.2 and in Bill C-15, they're maintaining the, the borders of Canada that have sliced through different Indigenous nations, including Mohawks and uh, Anishinaabe and, uh, and um, the Okanagans, the Micmacs and others uh, who've had the, the US-Canada border uh, cut through their nations. That's being maintained in Bill C-15. Uh, section three is on designating the minister. Um, so the federal government has designated David Lametti as Minister of Justice to be the lead minister identified in section three. Um, although the federal cabinet can assign any minister for the purposes for the provision of this act. And the Ministers of Indigenous Services Canada and Crown Indigenous Relations are supporting Minister Lametti in implementing the Bill C-15 action plan. Although it's a whole government approach, so all federal ministers are involved, including the Minister of Natural Resources, Fisheries and Oceans, and so on. Um, section four, the purpose of the act is to affirm the declaration as a universal and international human rights instrument with application in uh, Canadian law. And 4A is kind of redundant because um, although it confirms the declaration can be applied by Canadian courts, this principle already exists in Canadian law. So Article 4A is merely an affirmation of the status quo. And Section 4B, um, Bill C-15 is to provide a framework for the Government of Canada's implementation of the declaration. And um, Although 4B specifies the objective is to provide a framework for implementation by the Canadian government, the purpose of Bill C-15 is not to implement the declaration, but rather to provide a framework for its implementation in the future through the action plan. Uh, Bill C-15 is not an immediate implementation of the declaration. So it sets out a process. Um, section five involves measures uh, for consistency of laws with the UN declaration. The Government of Canada will have to take all necessary steps to make federal laws consistent with the declaration. And again, it's important to note that there's no immediate implementation of the declaration. This section establishes an ongoing process of working with Indigenous peoples for legal review and reform that will likely take decades. Section six uh, involves the action plan. This section of Bill C-15 gives the Government of Canada the dominant role in developing an action plan to implement the UN Declaration in the future in relation to federal laws. Since under Canada's constitutional division of federal and provincial powers, the provincial governments have a veto in subject areas that may affect their jurisdiction. And the BC government is now the only province that has Bill 41, the Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act, a law to interpret uh, the UN Declaration in British Columbia. And section seven involves reporting to parliament on measures taken you know, progress made and measures taken on implementing the action plan. And Canada controls the pen in preparing the annual report to Parliament. So they can exclude uh, things they don't like, which include blockades or other things that may happen. Um, in terms of amendments to Bill C-15, the House of Commons made several amendments to the text of Bill C-15. The Senate did not. The Liberal and NDP Alliance rejected First Nations proposed amendments to strengthen the bill. Most of the amendments applied to the preamble, although there were two substantial changes to the provisions of Bill C-15 in section six listed here. Amendments included references to racism and sy systemic racism in the preamble, expansion of the preamble to identify the doctrines of discovery and terra nullius as racist, scientifically false, legally invalid, morally condemnable and socially unjust. And also recognition of the preamble that Aboriginal treaty rights are capable of evolution and growth and are not frozen uh, in time. Um, also, there was um, an amendment to section six to reduce the time limit for preparing the action plan from three years to two years. And um, the action plan must include measures to address racism and systemic racism. That's in section six. So 
now there, there's many complaining that reducing from three years to two years was too short a time frame, but the previous National Chief Perry Belgard was the one that that uh, put that amendment forward with his legal advisor, Mary Ellen Tripolophon. So Justice Canada's um, draft action plan has four chapters. Shared priorities is basically a pan-Indigenous approach where they're saying First Nations, Métis, and Inuit have made similar recommendations and the Justice Department has summarized those in a chapter. There's a First Nations priorities chapter. There's an Inuit priorities chapter, but that's empty right now because they're still negotiating with the Inuit what will be included in the action plan. And there's a chapter on Métis priorities. Um, the draft action plan contains departmental measures and lists responsible departments, or if, or if it's a whole of government approach and all departments are responsible, and the UN uh, articles that are connected to the federal policy measures. And the shared priorities chapter contains um, a number of measures for ensuring that the laws of Canada are consistent with UN declaration addressing injustices, prejudice, violence, systemic racism, and discrimination, promoting mutual respect and understanding, as well as good relations, including through human rights education, ensuring oversight and accountability on the implementation of the declaration, and monitoring the implementation of the action plan and reviewing and amending the plan, which is important since the plan will be in place for decades. And the Department of Justice's action plan shows they've organized the 46 UN Declaration Articles into 10 thematic themes or areas, um, general principles applicable to all of the Declaration, implementation and redress, self-determination, self-government and recognition of treaties, civil and political rights, participation and decision-making in Indigenous institutions, lands, territories and resources, environment, uh, economic and social rights, cultural, religious and language rights, and education, information, and media. So under self-determination, self-government, and recognition of treaties, um, I've just listed what the measures are that they, they say that they're going to deal with UN Declaration Articles 3, 4, and 37. They're going to issue a public statement of Canada's rights-based approach for the negotiation of treaties, agreements, and other constructive arrangements to replace comprehensive land claims and inherent right policies, but they don't say how they're going to do that. Um, so there's no stated commitment here. It's just a vague statement. Uh, they say they're going to co-develop approaches for the implementation of the right to self-determination through negotiated agreement, new policies, and legislative mechanisms. Another vague statement that doesn't contain any serious commitments and describe how they're going to do this. Um, they're going to continue co-development of Canada's collaborative self-government fiscal policy, um, which is available online. You can look at it. It's based on own source revenue and it, um, <clears throat> it's um, basically it sets out a formula on how they're going to re reduce federal transfer payments and indigenous groups or governments have to make up the difference with their own source revenue. So that's what that self-government fiscal policy does. It's a way for them as they offload programs um, to get indigenous governments to take up the slack on delivering the programs and covering the costs of, uh, including through taxation. Uh, continue co-development, uh, of Canada's collaborative modern treaty implementation policy. Nowhere in this action plan is there mention of historic treaties. There's not one mention. They do refer to modern treaties, um, but they aren't mentioning historic treaties. They're talking about engaging with partners on co-development of a service transfer policy framework. They, they're talking about continuing to implement the act respecting um, the Child and Family Services Act, Bill C-92 continue to support indigenous status sovereignty. You'll notice a lot of this is they're continuing the status quo. You know, they're, they're not really offering anything new. They're just saying they're gonna continue doing what they've been doing, but there's nothing really substantive about how they're gonna implement the UN Declaration. And then on the lands, territories and resources, articles 10, 26, 27, 28, 30 and 32, 
they uh, have set out a measure to develop guidance on engaging with Indigenous peoples on natural resources projects in consultation and collaboration with Indigenous partners and collaboration with provinces, territories, and industry. So developing guidance sounds pretty weak. I mean, basically, um, Bill C-15 replaced free prior informed consent with um, the domestic duty to consult. Um, Minister Lametti has said that uh, in his view, free prior informed consent means meaningful participation in consultation processes. So they're promoting consultation, not consent. And developing guidance on natural resources projects, again, it doesn't say how the federal government's going to implement its tr ongoing treaty and fiduciary obligations to First Nations in taking on provinces that are violating, you know, Aboriginal treaty rights, like we're seeing in Ontario right now. <clears throat> they have a measure here to work closely with Indigenous peoples to develop and implement actions to ensure Indigenous peoples and their communities equitably and consistently benefit from natural resource development that occurs on Indigenous lands, whatever that means. They're talking about advancing co-development of options to enable Indigenous peoples to harvest within Parks Canada administered heritage places. It's not mentioning um, co-jurisdiction or co-management of those parks with Indigenous peoples who were displaced by the creation of those parks. Um, another measure is to prefer, a lot of these have to do with fisheries. So. Pursue amendments and reforms to fisheries legislation, regulations, or policies, tools and approaches that better, you know, deal with management of fisheries, um, support for capacity in fisheries, program and uh, program supports in fisheries guardians, indigenous knowledge, management of fisheries, implement the Pacific salmon strategy initiative with fisheries. Um, they have a chapter on First Nations priorities. They'll continue to work with First Nations partners on funding to close the social economic gaps and advance self-determination. Well, that's just referring to what they're doing already. They've said there's a new fiscal relationship. They're offering First Nations um, still, you know, through the Indian Act, a 10-year grant um, as part of the capacity building. And then the self-government fiscal policy, that's the self-determination part. Closing the socioeconomic gaps, it's, uh, it's about the 10 year grants. So they're saying they're gonna continue working with those. There's nothing new being offered. They're gonna to continue to develop options for reform of the specific claims program and development of a reform specific claims resolution process. So there, remember I said there were four policies um, defining unilaterally defining inherent treaty rights. Inherent right to self-government, comprehensive of land claims policy, the specific claims policy, and the additions of reserve policy. So here they are compartmentalizing the specific claims separate from the, the other policies, which are all consistent inconsistent with the UN Declaration on Articles 26, 27, and 28 on lands, territories, and resources. They're saying they're going to co-develop amendments to the First Nations Fiscal Management Act. Well, they've already introduced that into Parliament. Uh, they want to use the First Nations Fiscal Management Act to promote more taxation, and um, they want to expand the mandate of those uh, fiscal management uh, institutions to tribal councils and to self-governing First Nations, because up until now, they could only advise Indian Act bans. So that's their idea of you know, how they're going to implement the UN Declaration. And also, they're talking about a redesign of the additions reserve policy but they don't state how there's no, and they don't state how it's connected to the specific claims policy or the inherent right policy, comprehensive claims, they're dealing with it as a component. Um, they're gonna to continue to support uh, Bill C-38, which they just introduced just before Christmas when parliament recessed, which seeks to address discrimination in the registration and membership, membership provisions of the Indian Act. Um, they're going to co-develop a collaborative consultation process on a suite of broader reform related to registration and band membership issues prior to any transition away from the Indian Act. The Indian Act will never be fully aligned with the UN Declaration Act. For Canada's laws to fulfill the UN Declaration Act, the Indian Act must be repealed. So they're openly saying that at some point the Indian Act is going to be repealed 
and they're dealing with registration and band membership issues um, before they repeal the Indian Act. But again, there's no specificity to this. Most First Nations, certainly most First Nation members don't know this is even happening. Um, they're saying they're going to advance the code of element of federal legislation that recognizes First Nations police services as essential services. They're talking about collaborating with First Nations communities to create viable and respectful alternatives to the Indian Act in support of advancing reconciliation, the First Nations self-determination. Well, this is where they're talking about the three doorways out that I mentioned, uh, the self-government agreements, the modern treaties, and uh, alternative legislative ar arrangements. Um, they're talking about supporting initiatives aimed at increasing First Nations control over service delivery, uh, which represents an opportunity to foster a more accessible health care system for the communities they serve, ensuring health services are high quality and culturally safe. Again, there's no explanation how or no commitment on how they're going to do that. Same with transferring health programs. They are talking about developing Indigenous health legislation within the next two years. That's what this uh, paragraph 90 refers to. Improve the uh, income assistance program, continue to close infrastructure gaps on reserve, continue uh, support lifting short and long-term drinking water advisories, uh, continuing efforts to advance water and wastewater service transfer and support self-determination service delivery models in First Nations communities, ensuring the implementation of the Accessible Canada Act is culturally appropriate, control of First Nations education, self-determination approaches at many levels, no commitments, just a vague reference. So this uh, Justice Canada draft action plan will be finalized and presented to Parliament in June, uh, by June 21st of this year. These federal policy measures are going to set the federal governments, particularly the bureaucracies, policy, legislative and budget, budgetary agenda for years, even decades to come. To finish uh, Canada's colonial project, what the Indian Act started, the assimilation of First Nations into Canada's body politic, now as federally defined indigenous municipal uh, governments or corporations. Because the Supreme Court of Canada has placed the burden of proof on First Nations, I've been advising chief and councils across Canada to use the methodology of conducting cultural and historical research, uh, computer mapping and planning to develop self-determination and territorial plans for traditional lands, territories and resources to take on provinces and the federal government. In my opinion, since the federal government is using its CANDRAP action plan as the reason to uh, repeal the Indian Act and impose its definition of the UN Declaration, those First Nations communities who do not take the approach of self-determination and territorial plans, the community research, mapping and planning, in my view, will end up as indigenous municipal governments under Canada's definition of self-government and the federal policy to eliminate Indian reserves by transitioning reserves into private property or fee simple under the Indigenous land title <clears throat> draft legislation being prepared by Canada and the First Nations Tax Commission. That's, uh, that's my presentation. So thank you very much. Hope it wasn't too much. Oh, thank you. Um... Thank you, Russell. This was a really, really informative presentation, and um, and I I don't think I'm speaking only for myself in that it's very much appreciated to to get background context and some explanation as to what the the draft uh, action plan entails. Um, so uh, I think we'll start off for, uh, with questions. Um, uh, I I don't see Solidarity Collective. Here right now. Oh, they're here. Okay, so um, we'll we'll start off with um, maybe we can start off with questions in the Zoom and then turn to questions in person. Uh, so there there's a couple of questions and in, in, questions in the chat. Uh, so I I hope I'm not not gonna miss anyone. 
Just one second, Mary. I just want to address something with the group here. Um, for anyone who doesn't feel comfortable coming up to ask your question, just so we can simplify things and it's easy to hear through the mic, we'll have you do that. But if you don't feel comfortable with that, uh, there is paper being passed out. Um, so you can write down your question and pass it up along to the front um, or to Shelby or Riley and we'll get it up here um, just so the question can be posed. All right, take it away, Mary. Yeah. Okay, so the, the first question uh, that I see here in the chat is, um, do I understand that, that the municipal model would make them subject to provincial authority? Yeah, basically um, <clears throat> the way it works is under the self-government policy, once you enter into a self-government agreement and it has to be you know, a referendum in, in the community, once it passes a referendum and a self-government agreements approved by an indigenous community, it has to go through parliament to be ratified. And it only takes effect after parliament passes it into law. And once it's passed into law, the self-government act will then set out what the powers are or the legal capacity and status of the indigenous government, which they say will have natural person powers. There's 22 um, self-government agreements in Canada. Some of them are through these modern treaties, but that's about 44 communities that have already accepted that legal status or capacity. So they're operating basically as federal corporations. You know, they're established through parliamentary law and they have these natural person powers, the same way a province gives it to municipalities, except these are a new federal type of municipality. And um, the federal and provincial laws you know, you have to harmonize your local laws with the federal and provincial laws. So those are maintained. And that's part of the problem, you know, like uh, there's cumulative impacts of the creation of the reserve system in Canada um, for hundreds of years now, certainly 140 years since the Indian Act passed uh, in 1876. And the provinces have been issuing licenses and permits to lands, territories and resources around the reserves and giving them to third parties. And First Nations, particularly in the southern areas, are being cut off from their traditional territories because it becomes private property with houses and farms and ranches and all of that. And then to go hunting in that, you have to go further and further away, which of course costs money, right? It costs money to travel. And uh, that's going to continue. You know, this, this is all based on the land base that the reserve system set up. So going off that land base, because they won't be reserves once you go into private property, but once you go off that private property land base of an indigenous government, you're into provincial jurisdiction. And you may have some aber residual land, you know, Aboriginal treaty rights to hunt, fish and trap, but, you know, it won't, um, it won't preclude the province from passing legislation that could conflict with your use of the land. And you won't have the legal status or capacity that you used to because you've replaced it with a new uh, relationship with the crown. I don't know if I answered the question. I tried. Um, <laughs> thank you. That's that's uh, helpful. The next question I have here is: What or how does the UN define Indigenous person in their own land? There was a Kobo report that talked about indigenous peoples. I think that was done in 1982 or 84. And they gave a general definition of who are indigenous peoples. Um, but in Canada, the late George Manuel, uh, he wrote a book um, that was Arthur Manuel's dad. He wrote a book called The Fourth World. And he described indigenous nations as being the fourth world uh, within the boundaries of settler states. And uh, he wrote that book in the 70s and it's just been re, uh, reissued because you know the concept is still valid. Um, and he also created the World Council of Indigenous Peoples in the, uh, the 70s. So he internationalized a lot of the rights uh, beyond Canada um, and started a lot of the international work that's still going on now. But it actually goes back to the 1920s to Descartes who tried to get the League of Nations to recognize the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. So there's been ongoing efforts to get the United Nations to recognize the uh, indigenous uh, uh, peoples and nations uh, at the UN system. Right now, if you go to register at a meeting, like at UN Permanent Forum, 
you can register as an Indigenous Peoples Organization and you get a card or credential to enter into the to the uh, campus of the UN uh, through security. Uh, and they're talking about changing that to create different categories of status for like Indigenous nations, like the Navajo Nation, for example, versus um, an individual that might go there who's not representing an Indigenous government. So these are issues that are still evolving. They're not defined at the UN yet. But they do define who our Indigenous peoples are. Okay, great. Um, another question here. Can you talk more about uh, the 10 year grants? So I'm not sure what this is about. So, um, the federal government uh, in 2016 signed an agreement with uh, Perry Bogard, the previous national chief, to create a new fiscal relationship. And uh, what the 10 year grant is, is it's um, like it says, it's a 10 year funding grant. Um, but you have to go through getting certified by the First Nations Financial Management Board, one of those national fiscal institutions. They have to assess your track record of managing finances. And then they certify whether you're eligible for the 10 year grant or not. If you're eligible for the 10 year grant, you can apply for it. And that allows you, you know, um, a band council to basically, you know, move its money up or manage its money over 10 years. You know, they're getting chronically underfunded for 10 years because it doesn't mean new money. Um, so there, if you look up um, new fiscal relationship funding, you'll, you'll find online some of the explanation from Indigenous Services Canada, what it means. But that's only for Indian Act bans. For those who are going into self-government, there's a whole different self-government fiscal policy. And it's it's um, a funding formula. It's not it's not necessarily a, a grant. It's based on inputs and outputs, but it's based on own source revenue. And the formula is to promote uh, self government or self determination um, by reducing the levels of money that the federal government transfers to an indigenous government. And then you have to make up the difference through taxation or other own source revenue. Um, so that's what self governing. Uh, First Nations are doing is under that policy. So there's two different fiscal policies, the 10 year grant and the self-government fiscal policy. But that's only for bands that have opted First Nations that have opted out of the Indian Act into the uh, self-government agreements. Okay, so we have another question here. Um, information to band members about what's going on is not being shared from councils. Seeking information from councils is next to near impossible. In your opinion, Rush, Russ, would putting pressure on band councils and organizations from members help in this? Well, I, I would say that it's not uniform. Some chief and councils um, do share information with their members and do have meetings. Others don't, aren't, others aren't transparent or, or accountable. One of the first things the Trudeau government did when it formed the government in 2015 is that this is, it suspended the First Nations uh, Fiscal Accountability Act that Stephen Harper's government had put in place where chief and councils had to um, disclose all of their uh, expenses, travel and otherwise, you know, uh, fees and all of that, but the, uh, that was suspended. And um, the Trudeau government has basically been working, using chief and councils to promote his reconciliation agenda um, since he got elected in. And um, it is difficult um, under the Indian Act to, um, you know, to get uh, a chief and council to respond to members uh, unless there's an organized approach um, of families and, you know, um, different members in the community, you know, youth elders and, and women. Um, I think as long as, you know, people are, are peaceful and polite and that they can organize uh, campaigns to um, bring pressure to bear. And there's also information available online that you could look for. You know, you don't have to get it all out of the band office. A lot of times the 
the band councils don't know what's going on either. Like I've been meeting with chief and councils across the country and doing, you know, a similar presentation to what I did here tonight. And a lot of them didn't connect the dots. They didn't understand what was going on. They were focusing on the programs and ignoring Crown Indigenous Relations who are dealing with rights. They've separated programs and rights in these two departments and the two ministers. It's two track approach. And it's confusing for a lot of the leadership who have to deal with this. And it gets more complicated because then you get bounced between one department and another. And I would argue that suits the Trudeau government to keep that confusion going. And now they're doing it with this draft action thing. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll read out one more question from the chat and then I'll turn it to people in person because I I don't want to I, I want to make sure that people in person have an opportunity to ask questions too and then if there's time we'll go back to the chat. So um, I have here it seems unlikely that land back can happen under unilateral government law. What forum do you think land back should be negotiated in? Well, this is where I've been saying to um, chief and councils that I've been advising is the, bird, the, the Supreme Court of Canada is under the duty to consult and put the burden of proof on, on First Nations. So when you get these consultation requests coming in from government or industry into the band office, um, like let's say um, we want to do a logging uh, plan in 30 days and here's a map or we want to do mineral exploration, uh, we understand we have to consult you. Uh, you know, here's the area we want to go. You know, um, many times the staff in the band office doesn't have um, the level of education they need to deal with engineers and foresters and, you know, uh, professional people on the other side who are sending these requests in. And then they're giving timeframes of 30 days or 60 days or 90 days to respond. And the problem is all of the communications from a First Nation are monitored by the government. And um, the emails, the phone calls, the meetings and everything regarding the consultation requests are all you're kept track of, there's a record kept. And it's all based on strength of claim. They're doing an analysis on does this group have um, you know a weak right or a strong right, and basically they're determining almost like a threat assessment. Are they likely to take us into court? And win? Do they have the evidence? And that's where the cultural and historical research. Most bands haven't done that research. They rely on larger organizations to do some general research, but they haven't done it. And each band needs to do it. You need to do historical and cultural research. We need to get good at archives and. Um, and databases, you know, um, because industry and government have them. And if we don't have the same tools that they have, we're at a disadvantage. They, they manipulate us. And uh, so along with the culture and historical research, there needs to be computer mapping, land use and occupancy mapping, interviewing your members uh, to find out, uh, professionally getting it done, to find out where they're using the land for hunting, fishing, trapping, and gathering, and also sacred areas and other things. And to keep that information private, you know, there's ways, protocols to do that, but that gives the leadership um, an indication of what areas are important to the community members. And then they can be alert if there's mining or forestry or hydro or other projects, you know, who, which families are gonna be impacted and where and when. And so the mapping is really important to go along with the historical and cultural research to back up you know, your rights, your connection to the lands, territories and resources. And then all of that can go into a strategic plan to either negotiate or litigate with the province. You know, you're seeing that playing out in real time now with the Treaty 9 bans that announced a court case uh, yesterday for I think 96 billion. Uh, they're basically saying, you know, they're going to proceed with that unless they get, um, you know, the government coming to negotiate with them. And industry, they're telling the mining companies that too. Don't think you're going to get um, access to our territory without coming to us. So that's the duty to consult stuff. And, and you see, this is where Bill C-15, the federal law for environmental assessments, has replaced pre-prior informed consent with the 
duty to consult, which is a less um, stringent standard. So in other words, it's consultation, not consent. That's what the federal government's promoting. So if they're gonna do an environmental assessment on the ring of fire or anything, it's gonna be based on this uh, consultation, not consent approach. And so I'm not surprised to see the uh, Cree leadership um, saying they're gonna take political action as well as legal action if necessary. But I think First Nations across the country need to start looking at that because now with this um, strategic mineral strategy, uh, it's basically a Canada-US strategy. That's what Joe Biden was talking about when he came here to meet with Trudeau a few weeks ago. They were talking about critical minerals. In other words, the US getting access to Canada's natural resources, which means First Nations and natural resources. So there's a lot happening. They just announced um, a battery, uh, um, plant in uh, Southern Ontario, um, hundreds of millions of dollars, I think with Volkswagen. There was another uh, uh, deal made, I think involving billions of dollars in Windsor. So it all has to do with the building of electric uh, vehicles, but they need the raw materials and where are they gonna get those from? They're heading North, um, not just Ontario, but across Canada. So all this duty to consult stuff and forestry is the same thing, right? All the forestry plans, all the natural resource development, uh, it's gonna to continue to happen and the cumulative impact of past developments impacts will continue to grow unless First Nations do these territorial plans I'm talking about, uh, off reserve. If you're just gonna develop programs on reserve, you know, um, you're gonna to continue to have your, your traditional territory, your access cut off by provincial uh, licenses and permits. So that's, that's how you get land back. You have to do the work. You have to do the research, you have to do the mapping and you have to do the strategic planning. And your people have to have consensus, you know, maybe set up territorial authorities with a mandate, you know, under your traditional laws um, to do that. But you still need the modern tools along with traditional knowledge, you need to combine them. And um, that's how you get land back, not by going to Ottawa and asking for it. You need to build up your, uh, the arrows in your quiver. Thanks, Russell. Um, so I, th I think we'll turn it to any questions from the in-person crowd. Okay, so any, did you want to go first? Close enough there. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yeah. <laughs> um, bonjour. Shinoi Banazik Nindish Nikaz Makwatutem Neokamingwani Nindonjiba Apachami Gwashta Bachamuatama Awe um Gikano Gikana we are Oma. My name is Caitlin Pay Pompey. I'm 31 years old and I go to Lakehead University in a pre-law program. Um everything that you just talked about validates things that I have seen since I was a kid. And um, I really liked your approach on the land back strategy. I do want to mention that these, <clears throat> you are pointing out how they create this smoke screen for everybody and that they continuously gaslight us. And I, I do agree with you about learning about our pre-colonial history and that everything has been whitewashed. Not a lot of people know that the United States Constitution is based off of Haudenosaunee's Great Law of Peace. Not a lot of people know that and they cite that in there. Um, and so my question is how can we, our own people, First Nations people, the indigenous people, because I'm tired of educating settler, the settler settlers about all of this. It's our own people that need to be made aware of this and to regain that, um, that sense of agency back and uh, pride. Not a lot of our people know about um, what our ancestors have done for us. So my question is, how can we stop 
our people from subscribing to colonialism, neo-colonialism, and 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 there aren't very much educators who are taking the time like you have to break it down for folks. And a lot of, like you just said, a lot of our First Nations people don't know much of this. And today we see them subs heavily subscribing to colonialism with TikTok and <laughs> um, among other things that are very superficial. And so that I like your strategy and in, in, in the land back approach, um, it's very hard navigating, you know, a Western world and trying to retain my language and my land and my people's original laws. Um, I wish there was more of us doing that work. <laughs> And so I'm asking you, how can, how can we work together towards doing that, you know? Um, and, and to not talk about these things, but to do them. That's all I want to ask, thank you. Those are very good comments and very good questions. Um, very relevant. Uh, I think about that myself. Um, you know, my friend, the late Arthur Manuel, he said Canadian colonialism has three phases. First phase was um, dispossession. The second phase was uh, dependency because of the dispossession. And the third pay phase was oppression. When we try to fight back against the dependency, we were, the, they sick injunctions and the police on us, you know especially when it involves our lands and territories. And um, I think, um, you know, I worked with the I Don't Know More ladies there when the I Don't Know More movement was going there with, uh, with a couple of them. Um, they did um, a good approach on their networking and the education uh, forums that they did to inform the people about what Harper was doing and the laws he was changing. I think, we have the tools, the technology you're talking about can be used, um, you know, um, strategically if we get the content together. You know, what, what we have to do about our teaching our traditional uh, knowledge and protocols and methods. And uh, I think like what you're doing here in Thunder Bay is a good example of organizing, bringing the people together and talking about what's happening. Um, but what I've been saying is we need to focus on our internal capacity. You know, I was involved, I helped create the, <laughs> the Aboriginal Liberal Commission in 1990. Uh, a lawyer friend of mine, Dave Nawagabo, talked me into it. And I said to him, you know, Dave, uh, he says, you're always complaining, Russ, about the government not knowing what they're doing about policies. So now's your chance to educate a party before it forms the government. And so I told him, I said, you know, Dave, um, I'll look on it as an experiment. We can try it out. And so we created the Aboriginal People's Commission of the Liberal Party of Canada in 1990. And uh, there were table officers, there were co-chairs, Dave was a co-chair. I was vice president of policy for the, the Aboriginal Liberal Commission from 1990 to 94. But that's when they elected John Cretchen in as prime minister or as leader of the uh, Liberal Party, and then he became prime minister. And I knew him as Mr. White Paper, right? Um, throughout university, I'd learned about the white paper and I, I knew all about him. So I was uncomfortable that we just set up this Aboriginal commission with him as the leader. And just two weeks later, you know, while, while the meeting was happening in Calgary, we were creating that, Meech Lake happened. People were coming up to me asking me if I was Elijah Harper. And because uh, he was the one who killed him. And uh, a lot of them were congratulating me, right? And I had to keep telling them it wasn't me. Um, but then two weeks later, on July 11th in 1990, that's when there was the shootout in Gunasabage, uh, the sister community to my community, Gunawangi. And um, that led to the, you know, 78-day standoff, um, you know, what they called Indian summer. Um, 
and that was never resolved. You know that whole whole issue at Gunasadagi, the land issue. So you know, I tried the establishment approach. I've dealt with chief and councils. I've also worked with customary chiefs, like they were recognized under the Indian Act, but they were under custom. And um, I think it's the internal capacity development that we have to work on. Like I said, this research mapping and planning approach, we need to get that organized um, within each of our communities. You know, the Trudeau government's been putting a lot of money into the band offices through these nation to nation uh, funds and uh, uh, community, comprehensive community planning. There's all this money they're giving. But what I find is most councils are just doing what Ottawa says. They're not developing our own plans. And we need to develop our internal capacity to do that because sooner or later, the conservatives are going to get in. It may be this next federal election. It might be the one after. But sooner or later, Canadians are going to get tired of liberals and they're going to replace them. And once they replace them, um, we can't keep thinking that a political party is going to save us or that the government's going to save us. We need to start working on our own futures. And especially now with the way that the federal government's interpreting this UN declaration, they're gonna be developing uh, that final um, action plan by June 21st of this year on Indigenous Day so that they can trot it out to Canada and say, look what we're doing for, ind for Indigenous peoples. We've got a plan to implement the UN declaration. Meanwhile, it's based on all of the existing domestic policies that have been using to terminate our rights. That's what I tried to get across in my presentation. They're not coming up with anything new. They're using the UN Declaration to finish us off <laughs> uh, as an excuse to say, well, we're recognizing your self-determination as they cut us loose because they're separating our rights to lands from self-government and they compartmentalized everything. So we need to focus on uh, internal education, developing and networking, using the tools we have. You know, Zoom, Zoom, uh, maybe more Zoom meetings, maybe uh, in-person meetings. Uh, if you can't do it on the reserve, do it in a town near the reserve and get the people to come out. Because you know, sometimes uh, chief and council don't want you to have <laughs> meetings uh, in their in their facilities, but you can always have it off reserve somewhere. And many of our people are off reserve. You know, they should be a uh, part of the, the solution. We can't just exclude them just because the feds don't want to fund them. So we only have banned membership lists or give programs and services on reserve because Ottawa says so. We need to come up with our own plans and strategies to do that. But first of all, we need to know what's happening to us. And that's why I've been speaking out, you know, about this uh, UN action plan. Because to me, it's, it's white paper 2.0 because, you know, 50 some years ago, that's what they proposed was to, if you look at the white paper, they wanted to remove the legal distinctions between Indians and Canadians through different ways, ending the treaties, ending the reserves, you know, forcing us into, you know, uh, under the provincial governments for programs and everything. And if you look, they're doing it. They've dissolved Indian affairs. They're changing our legal status. Uh, through these self-government agreements and modern treaties and this alternative legislation. So, you know, they're, they're, they've been implementing their plan for over 50 years when Jean Chrétien was uh, Minister of Indian Affairs and became Prime Minister. He was the one that imposed the self-government policy, the First Nations Land Management Act and the Fiscal Management Act that the Trudeau government is implementing now. Those three are the main sources of, of what they're imposing on us now but it came from Kretchen. And I know this because I was a liberal insider for about four years and I was involved in the Red Book in 93. Uh, Dave and myself and others were the ones who got the liberal government to, to say that they would act on the premise that the inherent right to self-government um, is an existing right under section 35 of the constitution. But in 1995, Kretchen imposed a self-government policy and um, without consultation. And that's the policy everybody's negotiating under now. So I have some of this insider knowledge of knowing how you know the government's been managing this. Most community people don't know this, but I've been watching you know, the chief and council system that's being used by Ottawa. And it's all based on the dependency of funding, right? Everybody's chasing the money. How do we get the money for programs and services? And our people need the programs and services. You can't say, well, we don't want your money. 
this is needed for education, for income assistance, uh, child and family, you know, all of those are important programs. But we should be designing them and taking over ourselves. But we can't do that if we don't have a plan. And if we don't make our own plans, we're going to be streamlined into Ottawa's national plan. Ottawa has a national plan. We don't. Each band and chief and council is doing their own, trying to make their own agreement. So band by band, Trudeau's, you know, making the deals. But that's what I think. Use the tools. Hold, hold uh, more sessions to educate ourselves about our own traditions and customs. And plan actions. Take action. Don't just use that information and sit on it. Take action. I'm not going to tell you what to do, <laughs> but I'm sure you could be creative and think of things you could do. <laughs> And thanks, Russell. Is there any more questions in person? Okay. Hi, my name is Natalie Lagarde. And I've uh, attended Lakehead University here in Thunder Bay, and I was a student of the illustrious Mr. Dennis McPherson and his Indigenous Learning um, degree, <laughs> as well as political science. So it was quite a juxtapose of black and white when I um, seen the difference between the two because I discovered his uh, <clears throat> Aboriginal worldview, worldviews that kind of stripped away everything that I was learning in political science, the whitewashed version, right? Mm -hmm. So what I've um, seen today is like, I already knew that the Undrift was going to be another white paper, right? From TikTok. <laughs> That's where I got it from. Anyway, um, but the thing is, is that I'm questioning is the Sue Generis that you speak of, right? That's what you're speaking of, is for us to gather our own Sue Generis traditional knowledge, our own Sue Generis um, ways of being, our own unique um, ways of uh, our world for you, right? So this is from Dennis, actually, that he taught me, and I was telling it to the travel councils, is sure, let's let's take the programming, let's take the programming money from the 10-year program. And no, 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 no. Let's just do what the government requires, just give them their requirements, but also at the same time glean our traditional knowledge and um, store that for ourselves and tuck it away for the day that we might have a core challenge, right? Because that's where the Sioux Generis always trumps um, federal and provincial policies with the not notwithstanding clause. And the notwithstanding clause, I think, from what I remember, I'm dusting off my education, <laughs> um, this notwithstanding clause trumps everything with Aboriginal treaties. It, it doesn't apply to uh, it doesn't apply to Section Thirty Five. It applies to the Charter. Well, wouldn't that be enough to to unseat it because it's unseat. Sec, sec, section 35 is in part two of the Constitution, and that's that's the section that says the existing Aboriginal treaty rights of Aboriginal peoples are hereby recognized and affirmed. So it's it's the notwithstanding clause cannot be used to trump Aboriginal treaty rights. It can trump individual rights in the Charter, but it can't uh, can't trump. Section 35, collective rights, because Section 35 Aboriginal treaty rights are collective rights. You only have rights as an individual because you're a member of a group. 
you can't just run off uh, and act as if you're independent of those. Well, under but, so what I'm hearing you saying is section 92 or section 35 will have a second, or is it section 92 and 91 that will have a, a codicil clause that will give this 10 year commitment to this programming money that will pretty much extinguish us as First Nation reserves and make us municipalities, is that? Oh, okay, so let's be clear. We're talking about two constitutions here. <laughs> That's the framework of Canada. There's the Constitution Act of 1867, what they used to call the British North America Act. That's what divided federal and provincial powers, section 91 powers and section 92 powers. And section 9124 is where the federal parliament has exclusive legislative authority over Indians and lands reserved for Indians. So that's how they passed the Indian Act was through that head of power. And that's how they passed the Indigenous Child and Family Services Act, the Indigenous Languages Act. They use section 9124. But they're using section 9124 to define the Constitution Act 1982, which recognizes and affirms existing Aboriginal treaty rights. They're using their legislative powers um, to enter into agreements to define Section 35 rights. That's how they're doing it. They're replacing our uh, original undefined rights with these newly defined rights that we agree to, we consent to. Because we do have the doctrine of consent. And that goes right back to a first contact, you know, with wampum uh, treaties all the way through. There's always been the doctrine of consent versus the doctrine of discovery. Okay, so then that's, that's what we're what, pushing. Right. So what like it's been the it's been this um, doctrine of consent lately <clears throat> that's come to the forefront. But I was just teaching my my indigenous my my young. She's made me so proud. My daughter, she's in her first year of college in Victoria, and um, she's learning about court cases. Like you know, and she's going through the educational process. So she's lots of tears because she's amongst very privileged, <laughs> a privileged cohort in her classes right now. She doesn't have her fellows with her. But, yeah. um, but what I was thinking was, I think that um, the fiduciary responsibility of the federal government that's been affirmed and established, wouldn't that over, wouldn't that principle become very important in all this that they have a duty to act in our best best interest in the highest highest sense and even though they, they're they, the ones they who do. are doing it like, the, the, the federal government does have a fiduciary obligations but the problem is they know that most bands don't have the money to take them to court because they're dependent on transfer payments for programs and services and you can't use those monies to sue the government well, unless the they give you permission the blood reserve of Alberta is always taking up these challenges and they've actually taken up the idle. They're Lamar. a big band. That, that omnibus. They have money. Bill, that was, yeah, they were the, they're the ones who are challenging it. And when it was going through, you know, the federal government was like, it was all hidden that all the MPs were a part of that affidavit that um, they all signed the affidavit challenging it. In, in court and I couldn't believe it. But I don't know why I was surprised, but I don't know, I'm just surprised even, even though I expect it. But um, so I guess we're gonna be like, kind of like organizing another, I don't know more kind of campaign for June 21st for National Aboriginal Day, right? <laughs> the same thing. I was I'm, I'm, not, I'm not telling people what to do, but like I said, <laughs> <laughs> But I would say I agree with what you're saying. I've been saying the same thing, that we have to have a double agenda. We have to fulfill the requirements of our funders for the funding that we get in at the community level. But we also need to be working on our own internal plans, uh, our, our priorities, to put a plan in place, uh, a self-determination plan to get out of the Indian Act on our own terms. Yes, and, well, you got to look at and that won't happen by magic. And you have to strategically design the research so that it's just not for going to court and negotiating. You can use it for curriculum development for education. 
to teach the children about their history and culture and identity. It's just not for court and it's just not for negotiations. If you design the research right, the historical and cultural research, you can use it for multiple purposes. But you well, have you to have look, people that know what they're doing. Well, you got to look at KI, right? Kitchen. I, I've, I've been to KI and I've, I've advised them a couple yeah. times. Now. Yeah, well, they're the ones who, who successfully overturned the court challenge from Five the minutes. industry. They went to jail for six months, too. Yes, yes. And they were their heroes because of it. So that's something and, to And they've on. also done the cultural mapping I've been talking about. They've done a cultural well, that's mapping. The that's the Sui Generis. Yeah. Well, Sui, Sui Generis just means unique. You know, you got to be careful with that because the Supreme Court of Canada used that. And they used it in the Marshall case. And they said to the Micmacs, you have a Sui Generis uh, treaty right to fish. But you know, you can only earn a moderate livelihood. So how come Micmacs can only earn a moderate livelihood? Well, everybody else can earn, a, you know, a, a living off of it. Well, that was just their interpretation, but thank you. Oh, but that's what I'm saying. You gotta be careful about using that term. It didn't come from us, that's the court interpretation. And we have to recognize the court tests and principles. That's we have to deal with them, but we need to develop our own legal systems and orders. We need to bring, our own knowledge back to those things that were taken away by the Indian Act. So we need to work on that. Yeah, I, I'm, I just got sucked into this. <laughs> uh, I'd like to make one, a little comment here that kind of uh, the foundation of all these arguments that everybody's presenting and arguing and whatnot. Uh, some of you may remember or may not remember that back when 1492 Columbus discovered America, uh, uh, yeah. and the perceptions back then were the settler population being a society that uh, came to America, and those that were here at that time uh, were to, perceived to be pagans that it is, it is right uh which kind of uh documented in the doctrine of discovery right that that uh actually the, the, the catholic church has kind of shied away from just lately although it's been used as a foundation doctrine for, for constitutions in north america just just a correction the catholic church repudiated it they didn't rescind it yeah that recent statement they made yeah okay and 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 anyway leading off from that uh uh through that period of time 1492 up until uh, uh 1856 i think it was thereabouts where where uh the colonial government of the day uh passed a statute called uh uh the gradual civilization of the Indians of the province. Now, you know, if that's one side of it. So if you look the at the 1880s, and that was uh, directed at my band, Gunawaga. No, I think it was 1856. But nope. but uh, if you reverse they start, that. They started with some, but the, the gradual okay, uh, uh, gradual not, civilization act of uh, Indians was passed in the 1880s. Okay, okay well, I'm not going to argue with you about this. But anyway. Uh, uh, if the reverse of that was say basically saying that Indians were uncivilized, right? So yeah. that was rectified the following year with uh, an act for the enfranchisement of Indians, right? So, so when we look at enfranchisement and the legal implications of it, it's basically to gain civil rights and liberties. So we as Indians could gain civil rights and liberties uh, from 1857, uh, and basically until 1985, right? Uh, and what happened in 1985 was we made a progressive step backwards, which is the progressive step backwards was that enfranchisement in the Indian Act was repealed. So I would interpret that in a context that since 1985, uh, I have been relegated to the same position 
that my ancestors were in 1856, uncivilized and without an ability to become uh, uh, a, a, a civilized member of society in Canada today. Thank you. Okay, there's another question back there. Bojo, watch ya. Okay, just I'm gonna see what in the book. I'm gonna see what in the book. I'm gonna do them. I'm gonna sum it up. My question, and I've been trying to figure this out for a while now. The Andrip, our ancestors never gave up land, never gave up their rights, didn't understand what was going on when Duncan Campbell Scott went to KI, <clears throat> went to Wendigo Lake. When he traveled those lakes, our lakes, and exploited us. And now, 50 years later, as you say, and then some, 150 years, they are now gonna, going to try to uh, give back without any, I don't understand. I don't understand what's really going on and why would they give back something that we never gave or why would they want to try to do this. And our First Nation leaders in our area don't even know because they change chiefs, like you change your underwear. Hmm. And it is. One person gets on for a while they sort of understand a little bit and then they just switch again. How can, is that the reason why they do that? And also the very thing I wanted to say, Ebe kukwe istu jiwe misnegen unshwewen kachukatek. The bakun ge un kachukatek. Uwe to the benamag ni wajan shinne. We na go with the benamag. Uwe mtu gojo with the benamag on shinnewen. Nungum deshkasek peneyansek. What I said was, see, men and people don't understand what I just said. It's the same thing that happened. Leslie Garrett was one of the translators in 1929 up in KI. A non-native person translating for and Schnabek. So what I'm what I'm getting at is are you I would like to see you and among other people to educate, do more uh, videos like this in the language. We have three dialects um, that are recognized. Adelio is Algonquian, Cree, and Ujikri. Is there a way that you can transcribe what you taught, what you just said? So our First Nations people, across the Turtle Island can. And I know there's some more languages. Is that possible? Well, I don't know about me personally, but I know that, that I've been in meetings where there's been translation into the languages. And I suppose that could be done and recorded so that it was recorded in the language that people would hear in their own language with the, what the message is or what's being said. 
that would be so what I know that Wawate, Wawate in Sulacout used to do a lot translation services and they have Wawate radio, they have interpreters. Miigwech. Well, I did go to Pemisikamak in Manitoba and present and uh, they had a, a translator when I spoke and it was translated because there were a lot of elders there too. So I've done that before, but yeah, it could be probably recorded and sent around. Okay, so it is nine o'clock now. Um, we'll continue doing some questions and whatnot because this is a very important discussion. But for those of you who would like to leave, um, thank you very much, Chimi Gwech, for, for your attending. Turn this. Um, also, uh, room full of people here. There is some people that already left. Wow. <laughs> Um, cognizant that it it is nine o'clock and and I don't know if um, if uh, you had plans um, after this that it, it, if we do go over time so I, I just want to want to flag that as well I know there's lots of questions still in the chat but um, that's okay I think if we can't get to them I think we should you know maybe like others have repeated do more information sessions in the future um, obviously the near future because June is going to come up quite fast. Uh, so. And there's not just me, there's other people that are working on this that, uh, that I think could speak to things. One of them comes to mind is Sarah Mainville. She's a lawyer. She's uh, been working on these issues too. She's a good speaker. Mm -hmm. She knows them very well. No, that's a good point. Um, so we can continue with questions, but it's 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 up to you if you've got. Uh, I'm I'm okay. I can keep going if you want. Okay, so so if there's no more. Sorry, oh, I I do have two in-person questions that were posed earlier on, um, just on paper. Mm -hmm. uh, the first of which, what what course of action do you recommend to combat policies like these that threaten and undermine Indigenous sovereignty? <laughs> It's got to start on the ground for one thing, and I think it's got to be from families and communities and nations. Um, you got to start it somewhere. Um, it needs a movement. You know, we're up against a big uh, system. It's going to take more than um, even the stuff I see happening with the Treaty 9 leadership right now. I think they need to have that spread more across the country to be more uh, national in scope. Um, you know, to um, to start pushing for recognition of our own laws and customs and traditions to be recognized as a basis uh, for self-determination and not their self-government policy. It has to be replaced and it has to be done jointly. And we need a good definition of co-development or co-jurisdiction because they keep manipulating that, the federal government. Ottawa, the bureaucrats. As you know, the bureaucrats are the real permanent government in Canada, right? Politicians come and go. But it's the bureaucracy that recycles these ideas. That's how come they can keep going um, for decades, right? With like the white paper objectives. You know, they're still implementing those now. And it's because bureaucrats are basically taking over from other bureaucrats and continuing with those ideas. And they keep their whole, they're driven by trying to reduce the crown liabilities and how much they're spending. So it's always about offloading their ongoing uh, fiduciary obligations onto First Nations themselves. So that's um, that's what we need to um, get organized around is to know what we're up against, you know, the problem, and then we need to figure out what actions we can take. But you know, there's there's short-term political actions to deal with responding to what the Trudeau government's doing, like you know this June 21st deadline. But the real work is the longer-term stuff because you know it's likely the final action plan is likely to pass, right? Because I don't see any real resistance. Frankly, the only resistance I've seen in Canada is coming from the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs and clans. <laughs> I haven't seen 
I haven't seen much uh, resistance to the Trudeau agenda across the country from either leadership or membership. You know, we're, we're just going along. And, um, you know, I think um, we need to think, like I said, about the longer term internal capacity building that we need to do. Because that's what's going to last. But in the meantime, if people are looking at a short term strategy and making it known that we don't agree with the process that they're using on how they're interpreting the UN declaration and how they're imposing an action plan on us using selective consultations, um, there's a way to react to that too and to send a message. But that's a short term strategy, you know? The long term strategy is how do we? regain our nationhood. And like I said, that, that means we have to document how we got to be here, our history, our culture, because the courts have put the burden of proof on us. And you know, if you do some action and you get hauled in the court, if you don't have that evidence, it goes bad for you. That's where the injunctions come in. That's where the police come in. You know, if you don't have the evidence to say, well, this has our, been our family's territory for generations, you know, what do you mean we can't camp here? You know, well, what do you mean you're going to log this out? <laughs> or what do you mean you're going to mine, go to mine here? You know, the burden is on us to, to show our connection to that land, whether we like it or not. You know, I don't think it's a fair system, but that's the system we're up against. You know, Canada is a separate state. <laughs> we're, there's still colonialism. They didn't get rid of it. We're still in a colonial system today. But if we want to get out of it, we got to make our own path out of it. Education is part of it, but also planning is a big part and taking action and using the land, you know, you got to be connected to your territory. Don't just stay on the reserve and be sedentary. Build some cabins, do some overnight camping, do some fishing, do some hunting, do some cultural education projects. Do some language projects. You got to get out on the land to use it to, to name those things. Okay, so we have um, another question here that's uh, kind of a two-parter. Um, is UNDRIP specifically self-governance over sovereign nations? Do we want to be fully sovereign? What does that look like? That's the first part of the question. I don't think there's any one answer to that because you know, the Indian Act has been applied to all 600 bands across Canada. Some have embraced it, some have resisted it. You know, some accept that as their, their norms now, you know, like they think that that's, that's, their, uh, that's their governance system. Some want sovereignty, right? Some want more sovereignty and some freedom and liberty and, and on their traditional territory, not just within the reserves. And um, those are the ones that are going to have to do the work. Um, to get access. Like, like I said, I use the, the Wet'suwet'en as an example. <laughs> They're an example of a traditional government that's out there using their lands, uh, territories and resources as a clan based governance system. As they've been doing for thousands of years, they don't agree with a pipeline coming through their territory. And you're seeing, you know, their resistance and, and the oppression that's coming back on them. Um, we're probably going to see some elements of that in Ontario, I think, in Northern Ontario in Treaty 9. I don't think it's looking too good right now. It looks like it's heading to a conflict because the Ford government seems to be wanting to literally bulldoze their way in, you know. So it's, uh, and, you know, I, I think there are other areas, like look what's happening in Alberta with the Alberta Sovereignty Act and in Saskatchewan with the Saskatchewan First Act. They're totally ignoring the treaties and they're saying that it's their, their lands and resources, right? And, um, you know, out in Saskatchewan, they're talking about litigation and, and blockades too. And I believe Alberta, I've heard them say the same thing. So, I mean, there seems to be um, all the provinces you can look at, something's going on. Quebec imposing the French language on First Nations who don't use French. Um, appealing Bill C-92, the Indigenous Child and Family Services Law. They're, they're trying to say they're gonna pass legislation over Indigenous languages in Quebec. 
So no matter which province you're talking about, they're violating our inherent treaty rights. And what are we doing about it? Canada is not helping. They should be. I think Canada be, should be using their federal spending power to fund uh, First Nations to take on the provinces to do these territorial plans, you know, to do the research. But they have their land claims policies, and, you know, all the policies they have are designed to bring us under the control and domination of the provinces. It's not to really build up self-determination, like they say. But that's what I think. And I did do a discussion paper for the uh, AFN National Chief. It is available online uh, at the AFN website. Because I have given advice to you know, the, the chiefs under the Indian Act, the First Nation governments, um, in that discussion paper. Um, you know, I was suggesting there should be a national political strategy, a six point strategy, public education, direct action, uh, international campaign. Uh, you know, there's six elements I recommended there and, and uh, that they set up a chief's committee on nation building, I said, to, to steer this national plan because um, it's gonna take a national effort, but we're not all gonna be on the same page. The government's been dividing and conquering us. And you know, since the Constitution Act 1982, there's three different classes of First Nations now. There's First Nations who have signed modern treaties and self-government agreements. There's First Nations who are at the negotiating table, negotiating under those policies. And there's First Nations who have been resisting them. And of course, those are the ones with the smallest number. I'd say maybe, uh, maybe 100, 150 First Nations that aren't wanting to negotiate under those colonial policies. But you've got 44 communities that have signed self-government agreements. You've got uh, several hundred who are at these recognition tables where the government's trying to get them to sign self-government agreements or modern treaties. That's two thirds of the bands in the country who are at the table. So, I mean, you know, they're, they're transitioning us into a federal, they're fiscally transitioning us into a federal definition of self-government, whether we know it or not because a lot of chief and council don't know it, let alone the members, right? Uh, I see Kevin Moran has his hand raised. If we, yeah, we can come back to in person. Um, uh, Kevin, if you wanna ask, uh, ask your question. I'll type it in the chat, Mary. Oh. I don't know if I'm answering these questions very well or not. <laughs> As someone listening, I think so. Um, so we'll, we'll 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 wait a minute here for for Kevin if he wants to. Uh, your if he wants, I, I I don't know if he's asking his question. You're you're on mute, uh, Kevin. But oh, hello. Hi, Russ. Hi, everybody. Um, Kevin. Big fan, Russ, of your work. And uh, thank you for continually educating uh, members, bands, and everyone across uh, Turtle Island. I've been doing this a long time. Uh, you know, I went from watching YouTube, watching you, and then, you know, actually getting to do an interview with you. You know, that was, uh, that was, really, um, that was really special to me. And uh, I just wanted to ask and, and kind of say a few things. Uh, there, there's a lot of division amongst um, uh, like true sovereignists, like uh, they, they just uh, disavow the bans and stuff like that. But that seems to be the mechanism that's being used to implement these strategies uh, imposed by the government. And I think, um, it, it, you know, in my opinion, I think if we use everything collaboratively, I think we could come up with a solution. Uh, because it's the bands that have the money. Um, you know, I'm grassroots, I'm broke, so <laughs> I don't know where I'm going to get the money to, to do the research and stuff. But um, and, and another thing, uh, some of the solutions, like doing the research and stuff, like I've contacted a, a few of the, you know, thank you for all your suggestions and everything. I've contacted many of them, and uh, I've actually got responses back. And um, one, one of the, the best ones for, for mapping is... Um, uh, give a shout out to Terry, uh, Tobias with um, uh, the book, 
that um, uh, living proof yes living proof yes that's one of 4500 copies i have possession of us so fortunate to find that on ebay um but uh, the union of bc indian chiefs is actually um uh trying to uh develop that digitally uh so to make it available for everyone and um you know somebody could just uh you i've already emailed it numerous times i think they've blocked my email but um uh they they they, they say they're working on it but that's a, a really good uh guide um to doing what needs to be done and um i think uh terry's actually been in contact with uh my nation uh, out in the prairies and uh, using the land that's great uh, because now we're utilizing our trapping because uh, we still hunt fish and trap in the prairies and they're, they're using that knowledge uh, to, to, to work with these uh, development companies but I feel that that could be used a lot more strategically in the, the long-term plan and yeah just just the all the different uh, sources of information. I think the biggest thing is a lot of people don't believe that this is happening because they, you know, they say as long as the sun shines, the grass grows and the waters flow. But then you also go back, you know, you go back uh, to the consent, the Royal Proclamation, the consent part of it. Well, we're, well, the ones that are going into these agreements are given their consent because I've noticed it in my own communities where uh, they do vote slang designations and people don't know what it is. They have no idea what it is. I think the biggest thing is just getting the information out there and like really breaking it down. Um, uh, there was a previous speaker uh, getting it into the uh, their own languages because a lot of the elders that uh, I talk to, um, it has to be interpreted to them because I don't speak my language very well. Was, oh, I'm working on it. I still managed to retain a little bit of my culture. I'm very thankful for that. But uh, yeah, there's a lot, definitely a lot of work ahead. And just thank you, Russ. Thanks, Kevin. Hey, so we'll turn back to the chat. Um, Try to find where we left off here. Uh, so uh, we have one question, uh, Miigwech. I'm interested in hearing about your experiences for the best or most effective strategies in negotiating with provincial and federal governments. I find the political processes interesting and I enjoy and learn so much from observing leadership in their decision-making at all levels. Hmm. Well, you know, I worked, uh, I was a research director for traditional use study for two sequentment bands in uh, BC. And so um, I had to bring together a, a historian and, um, and an anthropologist and, um, and um, we did land, we trained people for land use and occupancy mapping community members, actually Terry Tobias trained them. And they did current use mapping for the two bands, and that was all combined into a traditional use uh, study uh, report. And um, they're still using that. That was done in the 90s, and they're still using that information today. And um, I think that dealing with forestry and wildlife management, those issues, you know, getting involved in doing regional planning, uh, taking the province on in those things is important. And I agree about the two-year turnover under the Indian Act elective system. It's a real problem, especially if people keep changing. And that's where you need to start thinking about doing something like some kind of territorial authority that's given a mandate by the people to do the research uh, and planning around a larger territorial plan that gets taken out of the politics of, of the band council elections. Because these land issues take years, you know? To, to do the research and to do the plan and um, and to use it in you know school curriculum and stuff, all the reasons you're going to use it. But it takes a while to do that. And all the strategies I've been involved in have been based on 
having the facts in place to take on the legal system and the political system. I find that communities that don't do that, even activists, you know, activists that go out and just throw up a roadblock or do something and they get hauled into court and they wind up doing time because they don't have the evidence to back up what they're doing. Plus they may not follow the proper protocols of, of the people, you know, on how to, to do that. Because that's important too, to know your own laws and know what you, you should and shouldn't do in terms of your behavior. Um, we need to know our customs. We need to know our, our land management system that we had prior to contact, how it's um, used, how the men and women, the roles that they had and what they do to go out and harvest on the land and when, right? The seasons, the, the traditional cycle, all those things are important to know. But political battles, I've been in a lot, you know? I've been in logging blockades, I've been in uh, highway blockades. <laughs> I was at Wounded Knee uh, when I was 17. I was at the takeover of the BA building when I was 16. That's what started me going back to school, was um, being in firefights in South Dakota when I was 17. You know, the, They were shooting 50 caliber machine guns in that, at the Wounded Knee village where I was. Um, I was in there for a week because I went down there to find out what was going on and I found out <laughs> that's when I left. And that's what led me to go back to school to study more about policy, history, culture, policy, and law at different schools. But I've also worked for different communities, bands, and uh, and I worked um, in museum work. I worked on the Navajo Reservation. I got trained as a museum technician up to assistant curator. Um, I went in my home community, Ganawagi, and became museum development coordinator. But then I started focusing more on current issues, and politics and law. And that's where I started getting into policy. And I worked at the National Union Brotherhood and Parliamentary Liaison, and I worked at AFN when David Henneke was national chief, when Ovid McCready was national chief. And now I'm advising uh, Roseanne Archibald, the first uh, female national chief. Um, and the reason why I agreed to, to work with her and help her out was because I didn't like the way she was treated. They suspended her, you know, the AFM. I can't say too much about it, but I didn't like it. And that's why I agreed to, to work with her. So, you know, I've had different experiences and um, the community experiences have been the most important to me because that's where you can actually see change happen when a good uh, approach is taken where the leadership and the membership are working together. I, I, I believe that people have to be involved in the decision-making process. The Indian Act cut us off from that and we need to bring that back. Um, you know, under our Haudenosaunee traditions, we have the longhouses and we have elective systems. There's tension between the two. You know, I've always believed there needs to be some kind of way to kind of bridge that tension. And I think that's the case with Anishinaabe governments, right? There's there's the band council system, but there's also our traditional uh, ways of the people having a say in decision making, and that's what we need to bring back. But the, you know, free prior informed consent means information, so we need to be good at information management systems, because change is scary for people. You know, if you're going to propose a plan that leads to change, the people have to understand it and believe in it. So they should be involved in developing it and have a voice in it and a decision in it. And that means, that's why I say in the research process, it needs to be designed to involve the people, not just in a, in a room with a specialist and you know chief and council, but people should be involved. They need to buy in. You know, If you're gonna do community mapping, you need buy in because they're gonna say, well, why are you marking these places down? Who are you giving that information? To? What are you gonna do with it? All those questions should be answered, you know, before you embark on a plan like that or a project like that. So those are the kind of uh, strategy, I think, land-based strategies are, are what I've, I've supported throughout my life, because it's always about the land. Governance is part of that, <laughs> but it's about the land, really. I don't know if I answered that question. It's, uh, it's kind of tough to answer some of these. They're so they're kind of open-ended. I think that's um, 
that uh, that that an interesting theme that's coming up in in this discussion is um, believing believing in ourselves to uh, and and knowing that th this information lies in ourselves to actually um, to actually take back um, our jurisdiction over things like education, child welfare. Um, there, there are more, more. So this is a very interesting discussion. I think that there are more questions we can. I, at this point, I, I, I don't. I, it's nine thirty. I don't. I don't want to impose on your your evening. Um, um, and and maybe maybe we can have another discussion uh, in the future. Uh, yeah, where these maybe, questions... maybe that's a good idea. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. Um, I want to uh, thank you very much, uh, Russell, for taking the time to um, to speak with us this evening and to share all of the information that you shared tonight. Um, I, I think, I'd be glad to do another session sometime if we can work out a, a time. That would be wonderful. That would be and, and maybe we'll want to talk about, you know, after they ram this action plan through. <laughs> to, yeah. We want to talk about what do we do now? <laughs> Yeah, because, uh, you know, I think there's been some discussion or some statements made by the ministers that after the action plan is finalized, it doesn't mean that it's the end of consultations. But, of course, uh, what does that mean? So, um, uh, yep, I think the information sessions could continue for sure. Thank you so much for uh, for your, your discussion, Russ, and all of your wonderful knowledge. Um, and thank you to everyone who has attended tonight. Um, yeah, we'll we'll see about um, about putting up putting together some other sessions and um, uh, kind of compiling some information in, in other ways as well. Um, oh, thanks I for hosting. Thank Absolutely. you for hosting. Wouldn't have anything to host without without all of your hard work. <laughs> so very much appreciate it. Um, yeah, I will send out the recording to everyone who has registered for the event. So if you aren't sure if you're registered or uh, if you know for a fact that you you didn't register and you got the link somewhere somewhere else, um, please uh, email us. Uh, I've put the email. It's all over the posters and everything. I think so. Um, yeah. I think that's everything. I'll, I'll send my PowerPoint to Mary and she can share it around. Perfect. Really or actually, I have I have your uh, email now, right? You sent me a link so I can yeah. send it to you directly. Too. Perfect. Yeah, then maybe okay. we can send the PowerPoint along with the uh, recorded session. Yes. Sure. Yeah. All right. I'm going to end the recording now.